We'll be continuing our podcast series here. Uh, this video will cover Unit 2 and then Chapter 3. Actually, we're starting in the middle from the section on Arya and inshallah continuing to the end of Chapter 3. So let's begin. The first topic is Arya, which is about showing off. So first of all, I wanted to talk about the, the example of Rasulullah and he was known as somebody that was always uh, at this acted as if he was on the same level of other people in order to not make them feel as if he was superior. So Zayd bin Thabit, you know, told us that whenever he was in the company of other people, if they talked about dunya, they, he would talk about dunya. If they talked about akhirah, he would be able to talk about akhirah. He would always kind of participate in their conversations and be able to relate to them no matter what their topic of conversation. I think this is a really good example. Uh, he also taught us to fear Ariya and even told us that it's something that's a hidden shirk and this is because oftentimes you might do something with um, the hidden intention of, of pleasing other people and in this way by doing it for other people other than Allah can be a form of shirk so it's something that we should always watch out for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even told us in a hadith Qudsi that those who do actions for seeking his approval and the approval of others Allah will actually abandon them and, and because of it this being an action of shirk different types of riyah and actually we might be surprised to learn that some types of riyah can even be mustahab or recommended. So for example, if we're doing sadaqah in public, this is actually something that's encouraged because it can in, in, um, encourage other people or inspire them to to similarly give charity for a good cause. Similarly, if we're, if we're interested in giving da'wah to other people, especially non-Muslims, it's okay to do things in order to make Islam look especially beautiful just for the sake of spreading the message um, and inspiring other people perhaps to embrace Islam. And then secondly, it can be makru if we do things that result in giving us a big head and making us become more prideful of our actions. And then lastly, um, riya can be haram if we're doing things for the sake of deen, uh, for worshipping only to show off to others. And, and in dunya, if we're doing things perhaps related to our physical appearance or our actions in order to increase our pride and to be more respected or loved by other people this is haram um, we also were taught about the degrees of ria so it can be so people can be at varying levels of this and i think it's important to talk about it and perhaps analyze ourselves um, for, for any signs of Riyah. So one is the person that forms an intention only to do something for other people to see uh, because they so much they enjoy the other people's praise so much. So the second category is the person that seeks a reward from Allah but they're so absorbed in the Riyah that they wouldn't have done the deed alone if they weren't seen by other people. And then third is the people that are encouraged by others others praise but they don't neglect their worship but they they do it a little bit more if they're in the presence of other people and then uh, fourth is the person that is always at the same level so even if they're alone they would engage in the same worship but they they really love when other people see their actions and then the first fifth person it's the lowest kind of more subtle form of riyah is when a person might even hide an act but but nonetheless they expect people to treat him well and honor him for his goodness so this is to just to point out that Riyah can indeed be very subtle and, and easy to miss. So it's important that we sort of think about this and um, and try to ward off any types of Riyah in ourselves. Many uh, du'as to sort of ward off this trick from us. And I think this one was especially powerful in which we're taught to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bika wa ana a'lam wa astaghfiruka lima la a'lam. So Allah... I take refuge in you, lest I should commit shirk with you knowingly, and I seek your forgiveness through what I do unknowingly. I mean. The next topic is al gurur or self-deceit. So this is when we do good things and we're just really proud of ourselves and sort of complacent and and thinking that we um, fooling ourselves into believing that we are are already in the right and don't have anything else better to improve ourselves with. Uh, which taught in Surah Kahf that the greatest losers in regards to their deeds are those who, whose efforts are lost in the worldly life because they think they're doing well in their work. So they, these are the people that don't actually recognize they have a problem. Um, Imam Al-Qayyim taught us that if we were to sleep all night and not wake up for a single rakah but feel bad about it, that's actually more beloved to Allah than praying all night and being proud of it and feeling like, oh, we're, we're so good, you know, we did this. It's important for us to always have humility and to 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 protect ourselves from this feeling of being conceited and feeling too prideful of what we are doing instead of 
instead of being in this state of always trying to improve ourselves and recognizing our bad deeds and, and the many weaknesses that we do have. So again, um, some examples and, and tri tips to help us combat our, our tendencies towards being conceited or being self-deceiving is uh, Ubaidah bin al-Samith used to say, I seek refuge in Allah from being great in my own sight and being very little in the sight of Allah. And Hassan al-Basri, I thought, really gave us a great example. He said, don't think highly of yourself because of your surroundings in Jannah, because Adam salam was in Jannah, and we know what happened to him. Don't think highly of yourself because you're a worshiper. Again, Iblis was the greatest of worshippers, so much so that he was uh, in, even put in the company of angels. But we know, again, what happened to him. And don't think highly of yourself because you're related to righteous people. Abu Lahab was the uncle of the Prophet salam, and we know what happened to him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to make another famous dua in which he said, Allahumma aj'alni khayram mimma yadhunnuna wa ghfirli ma la ya'lamuna wa la tu'akhidni bima yaqulun. O oh Allah, forgive me that for that which they don't know about me and make me better than what they say of me. I thought this was really powerful, inshallah. Whenever um, we do good things and perhaps especially when we are praised by other people, it's important to remember this and to make, to ask Allah to forgive us for our bad deeds and to constantly um, try, and try to continue to improve ourselves and not be self-conceited. So in class, we're taught about several categories of the self-deceived and certainly this doesn't limit all of the people that might be in this, in uh, covered under this term, but certainly these are important types of people that we should remember and be aware of uh, lest we fall into one of them. So one is the scholars. So these are people that are that humbly that have a lot of knowledge, but they become distracted by what all the other people say about them and praise them and forget themselves and their own faults, um, for perhaps. And then secondly are the worshippers. So these are people that focus on dhikr a lot and, and constantly might remember Allah and do good things and, and good actions, but they forget about abandoning their evil deeds or even they might even think that they don't need to abandon their evil deeds because of all the good that they do. And this is a very dangerous place to be. Ibn al-Qayyim taught us that uh, a righteous person and a sinner are both capable of doing good deeds, but nobody will be able, able to abandon sin except for somebody that's truthful to Allah. And um, we should continue to, to strive toward this regardless of how many good deeds we do. Abandoning sins is difficult, but but it's important. And then next are the people that are ascetic. So Imam al-Ghazali told us that there will be some people that actually claim exemption and secret knowledge. So they say that they've, they've reached this really high point where they, they might even claim to be the awliya of Allah and say that they're sort of um, not subject to the same types of judgment that the rest of us regular Muslims are. Again, this is a very dangerous place to be. And then lastly, the category of the rich. So there are some people that might uh, be blessed with a lot of wealth, alhamdulillah, but they, and they spend a lot of it in charity for good causes. But their fault is that they think that this charity absolves them from doing other things uh, of living according to the sunnah and according to the teachings of Islam. They think that mean the fact that they give charity absolves them from needing to do everything else that we're taught in Islam. And, and this is, again, something that's very dangerous and we should be aware that we don't fall into this category. And Surat al-Baqarah, we're taught or we're told about the example of the person who kindles a fire, but then Allah, when Allah took away their light, they left, they are left in complete darkness. So Ibn al-Qayyim explains this as people that are hypocrites because they benefit from the light of religion in the world and they gain status and reputation because of their perceived worship, but they're not true to Allah. And so Allah will take away their light and on the day of judgment, they'll be left in darkness. In Surah Al-Hadid, uh, which was actually played in class, if you recall, we are taught about the people on the Day of Judgment, the hypocrites who will ask the believers for some of the light that they have, because the believers have light on the inside that will kind of guide them on the Surat, whereas the hypocrites will be left in darkness, and they'll call out to the believers asking for for some of that light, and the believers will say, no, you were tested and they, you had doubts and, and were deluded, by shaitan and now you will not be able to pay anything to get out of this so we should keep this in mind and inshallah be aware that we do not fall into this category of people the next topic is envy so first of all i think it's important to recognize that in islam there's actually different types of envy often when we talk about envy or jealousy and 
in English, you know, it's always a negative connotation, but actually we're taught that there's many different types of positive jealousy. So, for example, ghira is a concept of, of positive jealousy, and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi actually told us that someone who has no ghira will not enter paradise. So, we're taught ghira is actually the kind of jealousy that comes from honoring somebody or from wanting good for them. So, for example, we're taught the example of, of Ali radiallahu anhu who was extremely jealous for Fatima in a positive way because he loved her so much. One day she was using a siwak and Ali radiallahu anhu, you know, actually started talking to this siwak in a famous story where he says, how dare you go inside her mouth, oh branch of Arak, I see you and don't you fear that I would see you. If you were someone that could be killed, I would kill you. So, subhanAllah, I thought this was really um, just a nice story and, and really shows that he had jealousy, but it was a a positive way in this sense. And then um, secondly, uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi taught us that there's no envy except in two. So the person that Allah gives wealth and he uses it, spends it in the right way, and the person whom Allah has given wisdom and he gives his decisions accordingly and teaches it to others. So we're taught that people that have knowledge and wealth and they use it in the right way these are actually people that we should be jealous of because that jealousy can be motivational to us and hopefully inspire us to also uh, sort of emulate their path um abu bakr who was was known as somebody that was very very superior in his, in his deeds in islam and umar actually used to comment that i wish i could be just a hair on the chest of abu bakr because he was so jealous of of his superiority and worship and in good deeds that he just wished that he could be like him and i think in that way actually it was motivational for Amr and it could be for us as well so we'll talk a little bit about the causes of envy and then the remedies so the causes um, some of the more common causes can be self-pride so feeling like no one deserves to have what yours feeling like you have what you have because you earned it or you deserve it. This can be a very dangerous thought. And then competition, we can be sort of misguided by competing with others, especially for worldly things and materialistic things. Um, and this can be a very dangerous source of jealousy and envy. And then enmity or wickedness, just uh, hating other people and not wishing good upon them. So the remedies um, are many, but first of all, to remember Allah can be a very effective way to make to realize that He is the one that He is the is the provider, and He is the one that we should turn to for help. To make du'a to Allah, but also make du'a for the person that you might be feeling jealousy towards, can be a very effective way of ridding it, especially if you make it sincerely. Uh, ignore comparisons. I think this can be a very destructive tendency of us, and it can make us more prone towards envy. So just avoid comparing yourselves to other people, especially in materialistic things. Again, if you compare yourselves uh, to other people in, in terms of religious things, like somebody that gives a lot of good charity or has a lot of good knowledge, that's different. And then considering your priorities, realizing that the, we should prioritize akhirah over dunya will, will inshallah uh, make it easier for us to ward off any tendencies towards envy. The evil eye, I think many of us unfortunately have this tendency of blaming the evil eye a little bit too much. We might, and when anything, anytime something bad happens to us, we might say, oh, you know, this happened because so-and-so was looking at me funny at that party and now this is his fault or her fault. Um, this is important to address that and realize that the evil eye does not certainly deserve the blame for everything and we should realize our own faults and our own actions and also um, that we have power to ward off the evil eye. So Ibn al uh, Qayyim taught us that um, anyone who reads the last surahs of the Qur'an and the person who fulfills salah on time and reads surah al-Baqarah in his house cannot coincide with the evil eye. So there's, there's you know, really practical tips or actions that we can take in order to ward off the evil eye and we should be responsible for doing these things rather than simply blaming it for every bad thing that happens in our lives. So next is the topic of anger, al-Aghadab. So we're taught many times in the in the Quran and Sunnah about the importance of restraining our anger through patience. Uh, so Muhammad Sallallahu actually told us in a very powerful hadith that the strongest person is not the person who overcomes people by his strength, but the one who controls himself while he is angry. I thought this was really, really powerful and something certainly worth reflecting. Uh, in a in a famous story, one day with Muhammad Sallallahu and, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu were sitting and a group of people came to them and actually started insulting them. So they were quiet for a little bit and then Abu Bakr uh, radiallahu anhu got a little bit frustrated. He stood up and started arguing back. 
Muhammad said Islam, when this happened, he actually got up and left. So later, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Ya Rasulullah, were you angry with me? Why did you leave? And he said, when, when they were insulting us, an angel had come down and uh, were rejecting what they had said. But when you took revenge, the shaitan came down and the angel left. And I did not want to be in the presence of the shaitan. So, subhanAllah, I just thought this was a powerful story to remind us again of the virtues of being patient and controlling our anger, uh, even when it's very difficult and when maybe even when it seems deserved. We should remember these kinds of stories and, and try to control ourselves. So some practical tips of trying to remedy our bad temper, which can be a very difficult thing to control. First of all, making dua, th saying things like, oh Allah, I withheld my anger in hopes that you withhold your anger with me on the day of judgment. Um, Allah SWT tells us that he does not reward, reward a servant for his forgiveness uh, except in glory. So the rewards of, of being patient and forgiving are great and we should inshallah use these as a motivation to control ourselves. So remembering Allah and then also um, carrying a mirror both figuratively and literally can be helpful. None of us look pretty when we're angry and if we consider this uh, inshallah it should help us again um, avoid it. So the next topic is greed and miserliness. This is perhaps something that's a quality that's somewhat innate, innate in human nature, but something that we should be aware of and try to combat. So Muhammad Sallallahu actually told us that if the son of Adam was given a valley of gold, he would seek with it another valley. And if he had two valleys, he would want another. Nothing would satisfy him except for the dirt in his mouth. So it is, it is in our nature to be greedy, but there's many different ways in which we should combat this. And Sufyan Athodi, when he would see a beggar, he would actually welcome him and say, Welcome to the one who has come to wash my sins. And this is because, not that begging is encouraging Islam, but giving from our wealth, especially to those in need, is a very powerful and effective way of curing our tendencies towards greed and purifying our wealth, as we're taught, you know, over and over again in Islam. So, um, and then, you know, there's so many powerful hadith in this regard, many of them you've probably heard, but we're taught no one, none of us are a true believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Lastly, this brings us to the topic of breaking the habit of sin. So, uh, first of all, I thought it was worthwhile to reflect on, on this teaching by Ibn Qayyim in which he tells us that habits, you know, go through this process. So first we start with a fatara or passing thought. Then if we entertain it long enough, it becomes a settled. And if we, uh, and then it might become a niyyah or an intention. And if we become determined to do it, it becomes a zima. And once we do it, it becomes an amal or an action. And then if we do the action often enough, it becomes a habit. So I thought it's important to recognize that when we have habits of sins, it didn't happen overnight. It really does go through this process. And so perhaps as we reflect upon our, our deeds and our, our, hab our bad habits, we can start to hopefully catch things while they're in the process in, in order to stop them before they become habit. And then at, when they do become habits, it's important to recognize the um, our responsibility to, to repent and to to break the bad habits. So we're taught by Muhammad Sallallahu that all the children of Adam are sinners, but the best are those who repent. So sinning is not something that we should expect to ever be free from. It's sort of in our human nature, but the best of us are those who recognize them and the, and, our, and the ones who repent and hopefully continue to try to remedy our our bad habits and break our bad habits. So there's many practical tips to to do this. Um, the chapter talks about it in more detail perhaps, but I just thought it was worth mentioning that when we analyze ourselves and reflect upon our bad habits to think about the, the situations or the people or the things that make ourselves uh, more eager towards committing a sin and to be able to address those things directly in order to avoid doing those bad, those, those, in order to avoid committing those sins. Um, inshallah, you can refer to the chapter for more of the practical tips that were mentioned. I, I decided not to include them in this slide for sake of brevity. So that will bring us to the end of this chapter. I uh, hope this was helpful to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.